Hello, viewers. Welcome to the latest uh, edition of Literary Yard Show on YouTube. In this show, we have a very special guest. Uh, he is uh, James Edison, but he is popularly known as James Lee because he has published a lot of children's books uh, uh, with this brand name, and his books are now uh, become a popular uh, Netflix series. So, uh, uh, you know, the idea uh, to have a conversation with James was uh, uh, just uh, came to me a few weeks uh, ago when he sent me an article with the title called How to Build a Literary Brand. And I immediately uh, felt fascinated to have a conversation around this uh, topic. So uh, without further, uh, you know, uh, details, I would straight away jump into to and jump into the discussion and want to know from yep. James why it's so important to have a literary brand for authors to survive in today's world. Why it's so critical and how, uh, you know, authors can really have their name turned into a brand so that uh, their books immediately are, uh, you know, uh, uh, catch, you, you know, catch, you know, readers' uh, interest whenever they see them either on e-commerce platforms or in physical stores. So James, welcome to the show, first of all. Thank you very much, Anka. Yeah. Well, now, okay, a brand is mm -hmm. not just, say, a brand of packaged goods or a brand of car or a brand of computer. Mm -hmm. Any brand is an amalgam of consumer perceptions. It's an amalgam of what the company stands for, what the brand stands for, our experiences with the brand. And all these things really are in the mind of the consumer. They're not really owned by the person making the brand. Now, in a literary sense, every author is a brand because when, a, a, when you walk into a bookshop, it's like walking into a supermarket. You walk into a bookshop and there are hundreds of titles facing you, hundreds of books, hundreds of authors. That's now, right. if you're looking for, say, a thriller, you want a good, exciting read, you might go, you see the word Lee Child as the author, and you think, okay, that guarantees me an exciting read about Jack Reacher. So Lee Child is a literary brand, and he's actually built his brand very carefully. But the most important thing, I think, for writers to remember, we have a responsibility to our readers. And we have a responsibility as brands to deliver what our readers have come to expect from us. Right. And I guess the most consistent virtue of all is consistency. That is so important that your writing, your, your, the way you address the reader, the way you spin your story. You have a consistency in style and voice and your readers are never disappointed. Uh, and as, as, as Mickey Spillane, I think it was, once said, uh, your first, you know, your first opening line will sell this book. Your last line will sell your next book. So, and I think, I think as that's brands, a wonderful we, line. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's uh, it's so true because you, just imagine you're going into a supermarket and there are thousands of tins and packets everywhere. Same in a bookshop. And we are all brands. You know, Nora Roberts is a brand. And when she wants to write a different sort of book, she becomes J.D. Robb. In other words, she's a brand extension. Now, it's almost impossible for me to explain uh, why I like Apple. I have Apple computers. I would never think of using any other. And True. I've always used Apple. And somehow I've imbued in them my great faith and love. And if you said to me, here is a beautiful new, some other make, I'd probably say, no, I'll stick with my Apple because I trust it. And I know it will never let me down. So these are the sorts of things writers have to be aware of, that whatever you write, you're talking to an audience and you're building up your market. And it's a very competitive world out there in the literary world. And I think when we take it seriously and say, 
let us build a brand that everything I write will answer my reader's requirements. And I will never let them down and I will take them with me for as long as I write. And right. that's really what a brand is. So since, you know, uh, your own book uh, is a Netflix series and now, uh, Mr. Midnight, Beware the Monsters. So tell us a bit about this. How did this happen and how was it really chosen for a Netflix series? I think uh, readers would be really or viewers would be really interested in knowing this, <laughs> your journey. Well, <laughs> yes. 24 years ago when I lived in Singapore, uh -huh. I started writing these books. And if you believe in numerology... <laughs> The Netflix series began on the 24th of October last year. Okay. <laughs> so it's very oh. funny. But anyhow, 20, for 24 years I was writing this series of books. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made sure that I can't really show them on TV. It's a bit hard. You can sort of see them. But the, the look of the book, the styling of the book, uh, right. it's all regimented. And every cover is, is the same except for the illustration. Right. So I tried to keep them consistent. And it's like uh, the audience is saying to me, okay, give me the same but different. Right. And I've had <laughs> to maintain a consistency and style. And I think the books were popular because <clears throat> I wrote them for an Asian audience, for kids in Asia. Mm -hmm. And until these books came out, Kids in Asia basically had to read Enid Blyton or books written in America or England or Europe. So suddenly here's a series of books, horror stories, with big towering apartment blocks and uh -huh. jungles and supermarkets and shopping centres and, you know, all the things kids in Asia are familiar with and uh -huh. the food and the names of the people in the books are all Asian. And suddenly they feel, wow, this could have been happening in my district yesterday. I better read this story. And it, it became a sort of a series that the kids could own. And after 24 years of very successful sales up in the millions, uh, it became then a, a matter of time before a film company came to us and said, look, can we get the rights and we would turn it into a series and they presented it to Netflix and went ahead and it's on air. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thrilled with the series. I think they've they've captured the spirit of the books, lots mm -hmm. of horror, lots of humour, mm -hmm. uh, not too dark, but dark enough to keep kids up at night. And right. uh, it's, it's been this fun, fun experience, you know. So how do you balance promoting your brand alongside with the demands of writing and publishing new materials because uh, it's not as easy as it sounds and uh, I think would be a very good advice for writers who wish to be um, possibly closer to what you have achieved uh, through this Netflix series and the popularity that mm. you have gained over time. Yeah, what happened um, is that when the series took off, it took off slowly uh -huh. And then my publisher managed to get me into schools oh. and I could give school talks. So and then the school would say, well, he's given us a talk for half an hour to the whole school about writing and how to write, which uh -huh. was a very, it's a very simple talk, but it just triggers children's imaginations because I'm, I'm very passionate about getting kids to write because I think a lot of there are a lot of young writers out there who don't know they are writers so i try and kindle that flame within them and i would go to a school and sometimes at that school we'd sell 200 300 books or more one mm -hmm. school we sold 2000 books wow and the kids were getting crazy you know <laughs> at lunchtime and after school the kids were just all over us and, of course, when you do book launches, I was launching two books every um, three or four months. So we'd go out and hit the bookstores. We'd go to a regular series of bookstores in Singapore and occasionally Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And always the mob turned up and we were signing books for two or three hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that went on for about 10 years, after which we all got a bit tired and older and slowed it down a little bit. But by that time, the series was well-grounded and well-established. 
And I think that's you don't that's... always have to. Yeah, you don't always have to do these intensive sessions at, at, with the public. I mean, I you know some authors rarely appear in public. They do television interviews. Okay. Um, I did a little of that in Singapore, but not much. Most mm -hmm. of mine was face to face with the kids. I think having your interactions with your uh, direct audience that that's the key, I believe, in your case, and I think that's the key, uh, key in uh, many of the successful writers' case. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good because a couple of things you get to know your audience. You've talked to them, right. and they're all going, "Oh, Mr. Midnight, Mr. Lee, wow, wow, wow!" You know, and you listen and you pick <laughs> up clues of what they like. And right. because I had to sign their names in the book, we developed a system whereby mm -hmm. one of the publisher's reps would stand at the queue and mm -hmm. get the kids to write their names on pieces of paper to save time. So they'd walk up to me, give me the piece of paper with their mm -hmm. name correctly spelt, and I could sign it immediately. The benefit wow. of that was I got all those little pieces of paper and put them in my pocket. <laughs> and, of course, <laughs> they ended up as characters in the books. And the kids were so thrilled. <laughs> How did he so, know my name? Another question. You know, you are carrying yes. two different identities. Your articles publish on Literary Yard with the name uh, James Edison, whereas you have a different identity for children's books, James Lee. Uh, how important it is to have the right identity or the right synonym for your books uh, to strike a chord? It's vital. I can't stress it enough. It's vital. I also write horror stories for adults and mm -hmm. crime stories under two other pseudonyms. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think but I need I to learn this can't... art from you. <laughs> yeah, you cannot, you cannot confuse. I've written, um, what is it now? I've got the total down here in my piece of paper. Uh, 199 published books. <laughs> And wow, it's, wow. It's, amazing. Amazing. it's amazing because, yeah, you're busy all the time, but I love it. I can't see myself doing anything else, you mm -hmm. know. And and, and uh, I think my grandson wants to become a writer because he's looked at me and says uh, he never has to go to work. He can stay in his casual clothes all day Plus, and never I has to go out. Wants... I'd like to be a writer as well. Mm. Once you set some right benchmarks in front of the kids, like... Uh... Even if you are not a writer, if you are able to have some corner in your house where you put up books nicely, neatly, good books, that inspire kids to automatically read and just follow the suit or in, follow in the footsteps yes, of your yes. father. It's, it's very, it's very <laughs> important to have that space. Right. Uh, you need a space. Uh, I, I, I defy anyone not to have one. You've got to have a little mm -hmm. corner. Now, this is just me. I don't work with music playing. Very rarely would I have music playing, particularly right. writing poetry because it's very confusing. But I normally write in absolute silence. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, uh, as Wordsworth said, uh, you know, creativity is, is recollecting in tranquility. So right. <laughs> I'm <laughs> recollecting and, and creating, but I need to be, very tranquil around me, no distractions. And I think most writers would have to agree it's possible. Yes, you Solitude can write on a train. the first thing that you yeah. need to write, uh, really imagine yes. things. Hmm. That's right. You need that corner. And also you need to be able to go back over things in, in quietness and read something you wrote yesterday and thank heavens we have computers. You can make changes immediately. You know, you don't have to retype. The whole book. Right. <laughs> and when I started, I was using a typewriter. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to use that anymore. You know, right. So, James, so, so, you know, so much uh, faster. yeah, in terms of building brands, you know, uh, it's very critical in today's world to have all, uh, to have, you know, tested all kinds of tools that are available to you, like, you know, social media. So, what role yes. do you uh, think social media and online marketing play in building? A literary brand and how can authors use these platforms you know to their best use and uh, right. really harness their power in today's world and do you do it yourself or uh, somebody I i'm sure no, i don't do it that. myself okay <laughs> i must confess compared to you Anka, i'm a very um 
technologically illiterate. <laughs> but, but anyway, no, my, publisher, you, you uh, yeah. my publisher does a lot of social media. Have, yeah, yeah my publisher <laughs> does all that. But mm -hmm. what we found was that once you establish a brand, it's like any brand. Um, mm -hmm. Once you establish Nescafe as a brand, you don't need to keep advertising it every five minutes. It stands there and it sells. And after a while, as an author, once you sort of get to the market, make friends with your readers, connect with readers and build that brand, you can probably take your foot off the accelerator a little bit because you do need to look after yourself. You need to let your brain have a spell. You need to write. You've got to be consistent and keep your standard up. And if you're all the time out there chasing every book sale and signing you're not going to have much personal space left in your life so uh, I think it's a lot of hard work at the beginning but later you can ease back a bit and you can do uh, well interviews like this one and you can right. do other appearances on television shows radio shows I've done a lot of radio interviews uh, mm. they're very good you know mm. but you get once again with kids when I first started I had to connect with the kids and, of course, their parents. Mm -hmm. and